In 1845, the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass wrote an autobiography in which he shares about the religious conversion of his former slave master. Over 150 years later, his words are still haunting. Let me read them. He writes this. In August 1832, my master attended a Methodist camp meeting held in the Bayside, Talbot County, and there experienced religion. I indulged in a faint hope that his conversion would lead him to emancipate, to free his slaves, and that if he did not do this, it would at any rate make him more kind and humane. I was disappointed in both these respects. It neither made him to be humane to his slaves, nor to emancipate them. If it had any effect on his character, it made him more cruel and hateful in all his ways. For I believe him to have been a much worse man after his conversion than before. Prior to his conversion, he relied upon his own depravity to shield and sustain him in his savage barbarity. But after his conversion, he found religious sanction and support for his slave-holding cruelty. Wow. What is worse than wicked cruelty? Wicked cruelty engaged in the name of God. What is worse than people engaging in selfish, sinful, domineering behavior? It's when they do those same things, claiming the mantle of divine authority. So I don't know if this is new or it's just a lot more public now, but over the last few years, there has been an an epidemic of spiritual abuse in the evangelical church. In our circles. What does my former ministry mentor have in common with the former director of my mission agency and my former university's leadership and some of my key church planting partners? They have all been credibly accused of domineering leadership, of abusing their power in a way that cannot stand in continuity with God's biblical demands and expectations for leadership. Now, we we could just point to these examples as high-profile exceptions to the norm or blame this concern over spiritual abuse on a society that has embraced victimization Or we could simply pin it on the cowardly musings of a bunch of overly sensitive millennials and other progressive snowflakes. And we would not be entirely wrong, because we do live in an overly sensitive age where we often take offense at the slightest perceived slight. And where being a victim or a member of an oppressed community can actually give one a place of privilege in certain communities. But the fact that a boy falsely cries wolf does not mean that there are not very real wolves lurking in the forest, possibly destroying the village next door and leaving behind masses of genuinely hurting victims. And those victims' lives matter. The reality is that there have always been wolves lurking in the forest. And even more concerning, there are wolves that take up residence in our own hearts. And we know this in part because we have all lived it. We have all been victims of harsh behavior. And we have all treated others harshly. But even more so, we we know about the dangers of this kind of sin because the scriptures consistently warn us about it. About the kind of hard attitudes and actions 
that lead to this kind of abusive, domineering leadership. What I mean to say is that this is not a new problem. And it is not a problem limited to pastors or spiritual leaders. Whenever a parent or a teacher or a police officer or a husband, or a politician, or a supervisor, or anyone else in a position of authority uses their authority to indulge their own sinful desires and preferences, or to insist on their own prideful need for control, they are engaging in abusive, domineering, unfaithful leadership. And that is exactly what we're going to see in our text for this morning, Ezekiel chapter 34. You can turn with me there. It's after Isaiah, then Jeremiah, Lamentations, and Ezekiel. Ezekiel 34, verse 1. This morning, we're going to look at what Ezekiel 34 particularly teaches us about faithful leadership, about bad leaders, good leaders, and ultimately the very best leaders leader. But I don't want you to sit there this morning thinking primarily about others. I want you to be especially thinking about yourself as you read and study this text. Because all of us have been given spheres of responsibility in our lives, leadership in our lives. As a mother or a father or a husband, or teacher, or shift supervisor, or small group leader. And it's precisely in those areas that the Lord is calling each of us to serve as faithful leaders. So let me read the text, beginning in chapter 34, verses 1, and then ending in verse 5. It says this, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds of Israel, thus says the Lord. Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. Let me pray. Father, may you give us insight into your word this morning that we might know your heart and live out your heart in every sphere in which you've placed us. May you speak through me this morning so that you might be glorified in your church, encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. So the background of the book of Ezekiel is pretty simple. The leaders of the nation of Israel had been deeply unfaithful to the Lord. As a result, the northern kingdom had essentially been wiped out by the Assyrians, and now the Babylonians are slowly destroying the remaining southern kingdom of Judah. As he writes this, the prophet Ezekiel finds himself exiled in Babylon with thousands of others who are just like him. The so-called shepherds that are mentioned in this passage are likely Israel's political and religious leaders who God had entrusted to faithfully lead the nation, but who had utterly failed in their leadership. Just before our text, in Ezekiel 33.21, we find that a Judean fugitive had come to Ezekiel from the capital of Jerusalem to tell him that the city had been struck down. The capital had been struck down, and that meant that the destruction of the nation was reaching its culmination, and that the people would then be left exposed and humiliated, literally scattered across the land, facing captivity, exile, wild beasts, and the sword. 
Though the people would bear responsibility for their own sins, in this text, God is holding the leaders uniquely responsible. Uniquely responsible. And in so doing, God powerfully reveals to us three characteristics of a bad leader. Three characteristics of a bad leader. First, we find in verses 1 through 3 that bad leaders are selfish and self-serving. Let me read that again. Verses 1 through 3 says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. Bad leaders are selfish and self-serving. They should be feeding the sheep. They should be taking care of those under their charge. But instead, they're just taking care of themselves. They take the fat of the milk, the milk, and they, they wear the wool, and they, they kill the sheep for their meat. They take the best of what the sheep have to offer, but they don't take care of the sheep themselves. Simply put, bad leaders use their leadership for personal gain. They see their sheep, the, the people under their authority, as simply a means to satisfy their own desires. Sometimes they use their leadership to get money or wealth. And that's certainly part of what we see in verses 2 through 3, as Israel's political and religious leaders use their authority to feed and clothe themselves, to take the very best from those under their care and to give very little in return. And we see that in our world today, right? So-called shepherds who fleece the sheep in the name of God. I mean, just a few months ago, I, I read about a pastor in New York who was wearing over $1 million in jewelry while, while he preached. And we know that because armed men interrupted his sermon and took it all from him. Just so you know, I only have this watch. All right, that's it. <clears throat> Unfaithful leaders use people for monetary gain. But it's usually not quite as crude as that, especially in, in our circles. The, the personal gain that we usually seek in our homes and workplaces and churches often has more to do with gaining respect or comfort or influence. As leaders, we like our place of honor. We like the ease it provides. We like to be listened to. We think our wife or kids or our employees exist, exist to serve us, to make our lives easier. Instead of recognizing that God has given us this stewardship in order to serve them and build them up to the glory of God. And yet there's an even more sanctified way that we use our authority to seek our own. And that's by placing our good personal or business plans or even our ministry desires above the people that God has called us to lead. Instead of viewing our work team or our church body or our family unit as made up of people created in the image of God, we begin to view them as pawns that we use to accomplish our business or personal or educational or even ministerial goals. Now, this is a huge danger for people in full-time ministry like myself. Because I can sanctify my ministry plans in such a way that I can easily, in the name of God and gospel mission, run roughshod over the people that God has given me to serve. And it sounds spiritual, right? I'm doing it for the Lord. This is exactly what seems to have happened to Mars Hill Church under the leadership of their former pastor. He is 
an incredibly gifted man, a, a powerful preacher, and humanly speaking, bears responsibility for the conversion of thousands and for hundreds of churches being planted. But his ministry vision seems to have become more important than the people that God had given him to shepherd. He said it this way. These are his own words. Quote, There is a pile of dead bodies behind the Mars Hill bus. And by God's grace, it will be a mountain by the time we're done. You either get on the bus or you get run over by the bus. Those are the options, but the bus ain't going to stop. And then he went on to say, quote, This will be the defining issue as to whether or not you succeed or fail. And ironically, he was right. Because just a few years later, he was kicked out of his own church planting network. And then was forced to resign his position of pastoral leadership in his church, leading to the very painful dismantling of the entire Mars Hill Church network. Bad leadership is selfish and self-serving, even when pursued when, with apparently holy or spiritual purposes. Secondly, we find that bad leaders are passive and indifferent. We see that in verses 3 and 4. At the end of verse 3 it says, But you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. And the lost you have not sought. Bad leaders are passive and indifferent. They do not know or care about the actual needs of the people they're leading. It's not that they can't see what's going on around them. It's just that they don't really care. At least not enough to do anything meaningful about it. And why not? Because what they really care about is themselves. And they're going to expend their energy and time and compassion on who? On themselves. Now, shepherds are not normally the owners of the sheep, at least not in the language of Ezekiel 34. They are stewards. The owner of the sheep has entrusted the shepherds with the care and protection of the sheep. So to fail to care for and protect the sheep is a fundamental abandonment of their responsibility. It's kind of like spitting in the face of the owner. That, that sounds pretty bad, right? And of course, we would never do anything like that. Well, let me ask you married men. God has entrusted you with the care and protection of your wife. Do you know the needs of your wife? Do you know where she is particularly weak or discouraged or hurt? Do you know what she needs to thrive in every sphere of life? Do you know what makes her feel loved? Have you ever asked her? Have you asked her recently? Because you may want to do that. Yes, God has given you authority in your home. But authority to do what? To actively and intelligently care for God's sheep. Or how about those of us who are parents? How often do we come down hard on a moody teenager or adolescent, but fail to do the hard work of drawing out whatever deep pain or confusion or crisis or even sin is underlying that moodiness. It's way easier to either ignore a child or spank a child than to truly shepherd a child. Or how about those of you who are supervisors at work? Maybe that employee who has suddenly become unproductive or testy, 
is going through a family crisis that you never knew about. And maybe you didn't know about it because you haven't taken the time and done the hard work of getting to know that person as a person. Or pastors. Maybe that new church member is not as responsive to my leadership as I would like because they have been so mistreated by other leaders in the past. And they've learned to be really, really guarded and cautious. Maybe it's going to take time and energy and compassion and patience in order for me to really know what they particularly need. And for them to know that they are genuinely loved by us in Jesus. We, we can't feed hungry sheep and take care of the sick and the injured and rescue them when they are lost without getting dirty. We can't do it by being passive or indifferent, by looking on from the side. God wanted something more from his leaders in Israel, and he wants something more from each of us as well. And third, we find that bad leaders are harsh and domineering. They're harsh and domineering. In the last part of verse 4, God says this, With force and harshness you have ruled them. With force and harshness you have ruled them. That's God's accusation against the shepherds of Israel. Bad leaders are harsh and domineering. Or to put it another way, bad leaders are bullies. Bad leaders are bullies. Harsh leaders do not lead or convince through sound reasoning or patient, faithful exegesis or through the power of their own faithful example. Instead, bad leaders lead through intimidation and fear, through threats and accusations and power. And this is where Christians are especially in danger of being like Frederick Douglass's slave master, using their divinely delegated authority as an excuse to impose their own selfish, sinful human demands on others. We see this when husbands piously quote from Ephesians 5 in order to insist on their own selfish desires and preferences. We see it when moms get furious and yell at their kids because they're going to be late for Sunday morning worship. We see it when bosses humiliate their employees. And when pastors don't distinguish between their personal opinions and the authoritative demands of the Word of God as if they were just one and the same. And spoiler alert, they're not. Bad leaders will try to convince us that they're just speaking the truth or saying what needs to be said. But Ezekiel 34.4 makes clear that harsh leadership is unfaithful leadership. And too often as evangelicals, we turn a blind eye to this kind of harsh, domineering leadership. At times we even celebrate it which is especially strange since this kind of harsh leadership is explicitly rejected both here and throughout the entire New Testament, something we'll look at in a few minutes. So, according to Ezekiel 34, bad leaders are selfish and self-serving, passive and indifferent, and harsh and domineering. And that kind of bad leadership has consequences, serious consequences for the people under their care. Look at what it says in verse 5. It says, So they, the sheep, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. The Israelites' unfaithful 
leaders cause them to be exposed and unprotected. Exposed and unprotected to the dangers that surrounded them. Literally causing them to be scattered throughout the land. Captured by enemy nations and quite possibly literally devoured by wild animals. And bad leaders do the same thing today. I mean, does selfish, indifferent, harsh leadership produce employees or children or spouses or church members who joyously thrive? Of course not. It hurts and humiliates them. Maybe even hardens them. And ultimately pushes them away where they find themselves exposed and unprotected. When abusive church leaders or parents or or husbands bully and control and gaslight their members or their children or their wives, should it surprise us when some of them say, I'm done, and they leave, and then they end up going through a time of wandering in the wilderness? I don't mean to justify it, but I'm saying should we be surprised when it happens? having fled from the spheres of relationship and authority that were intended to protect and nourish them, but failed to do so, they are now left exposed to the threats and temptations of our world. That's a consequence of bad leadership. In Ezekiel 34, 5, God is taking a hard look at the unique responsibility and culpability of unfaithful leaders the so-called shepherds of Israel. And he says, My sheep were scattered, and they became food. Why? Because there was no shepherd. Because the leaders had failed to do their job. Unfaithful leaders bear a unique kind of responsibility when their selfish, indifferent, domineering leadership results in their people falling away. And being consumed by the enemy. So for those of you who have suffered under bad leadership in whatever sphere of life. God wants you to know in chapter 34. That he will hold those unfaithful leaders accountable for what they have done. In this age or in the age to come. You need to know that. He is not blind to your suffering. But, and I want to see this with deep compassion, but you also need to know that God will hold you responsible for your own actions as well. In Ezekiel 34, God says that the people were eaten by wild beasts because of their leaders' sins. But earlier in Ezekiel 33, verse 27, he says that they will also be devoured for their own sins. Both things can be true. And that means that you cannot simply blame your unfaithful parents or teachers or bosses or pastors for the immoral things that you have done with your life. You too are created in the image of God. And that means that you too are a responsible moral agent. You too will be responsible to God for your choices. Though woe be to the one who provoked you to stumble along the way. That's what Ezekiel 34 teaches us about the dangers of bad leaders and bad leadership. So when we see any of those characteristics in our own lives, we need to take them seriously. We need to turn from them, repent of them, to take on the character of a good leader, and and most of all, to embrace the very best leader. But before we get to him, let's explore for a minute what it looks like to be a good leader. What it looks like to be a good leader. So whereas bad leaders are selfish and self-serving, passive and indifferent, harsh and domineering, leading to their people being exposed and unprotected, good leaders are just the opposite. 
It's as simple as that. They're just the opposite. This is what we find in this text when we simply flip it upside down. If bad leaders are selfish and self-serving, then first of all, good leaders must selflessly serve those they lead. They must selflessly serve those they lead. We see that in verses 2 through 3. In verses 2 through 3, it makes clear that good leaders must feed the sheep. They must feed the sheep instead of feeding themselves. They have to place the needs of their people above their own needs, esteeming others as more highly, more important than themselves. Good leaders view their role primarily as one of a servant, not as a master. So as parents, husbands, supervisors, elders, deacons, we are given authority to serve and to build up others, not to be served and to build up ourselves. Good leaders selflessly serve those they lead. Secondly, if bad leaders are passive and indifferent, then good leaders actively care for those they lead. They actively care for those they lead. According to verses 3 through 4, good leaders have to do the hard work of knowing the particular needs and hurts and situations of the people under their care so that they can know how to best expend their energy and time and resources to care for them, to set them up for success, to protect them from harm and error. And to create an environment for human flourishing in every sphere of life. Now, we have to be careful here so that we don't crush ourselves with an unbearable and unbiblical weight of responsibility. I know this is a heavy message. I'd like to insert a joke, but I don't have one. All right? I know this is heavy. <clears throat> so, so let me make clear Parents are not responsible to save their kids. You can remove that burden. Husbands cannot stop their wives from sinning. Remove that burden. And pastors cannot guarantee that every church member will make it to the end. You can remove that burden. But as leaders, we can commit ourselves to actively and compassionately creating an environment where God is glorified and people can flourish. I think that is the responsibility of a leader in every sphere of life, even in your secular workplace. Third, if unfaithful leaders are harsh and domineering, then good leaders should gently guide their people as examples. They should gently guide their people as examples. According to verse 4, good leaders are not harsh and domineering. They do not rule with force and harshness. Instead, good leaders show the way. And they do it with gentleness. They don't beat down and braid and humiliate. Instead, they encourage and love and build up. Even during the hard times, even in moments of needed correction or discipline. That's the goal. That doesn't mean that good leaders are weak. It means that God calls them to be meek. Power under control. Truth matched with grace. Shepherds who are also sheep. And that kind of good leadership blesses the people under our care by providing them an environment of security and protection. Good authority does not seek to place people in a prison of our control, but instead provides a place of refuge, of security, of peace. Our churches can be those places. 
Our marriages can be like that. Our families can be like that. And perhaps even our workplaces and schools and neighborhoods can become more and more like that as we extend good leadership toward God's world for His glory. Isn't that exactly the kind of leadership that we are called to again and again and again in the New Testament in light of the gospel? Let me read a a whole series of New Testament passages that help us unpack the kind of good, faithful leadership that we have been discussing in Ezekiel 34. First of all, to husbands, God says in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, even unto death. To parents, God says in Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. To bosses and supervisors, God says in Ephesians 6, 9, Masters, stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. To all of us, God calls us in Ephesians 4, 2, to act with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. And in Colossians 3, 12, to put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And then God reminds us in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, that love does not insist on its own way. And in James 13, 3, 17, that the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle. It's gentle. And for those who would serve as pastor, elders, shepherds over the flock of God, the church, God tells us in 1 Peter 5, 2 through 3, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Now listen. Listen. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Sound familiar? And then in the list of pastor-elder requirements found in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3, God commands such shepherds to not be violent or domineering, but gentle. In fact, the Holman Christian translation of the Bible actually translates the term violent as bully, saying in Titus 1-7 that an overseer as God's administrator must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not addicted to wine, not a bully. And in 1 Timothy 3-3, it says that they must not be a bully, but gentle. That's the contrast. Not a bully, but Gentle. And isn't that the model that the Apostle Paul himself gave us in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, when he says, But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. That's good leadership. I I want all of you to know that one of the primary reasons my family moved from Mexico City to Emporia, Kansas was because of the wise, gentle pastors and elders that God has given to shepherd you at Flint Hills Bible Church. And after living here for over a year, we have not been disappointed. Even as Ezekiel 34 makes us aware of some of the bad leadership tendencies in our world and in ourselves, let us also recognize and be thankful For the many faithful leaders and pastors and elders and deacons and moms and dads and husbands and wives 
and supervisors and co-workers that God has placed among us. Good leadership is a sweet gift. One that ancient Israel did not get to enjoy as we do today, right here, right now. So we've looked at bad leaders and we've explored some of the characteristics of good leaders, but now we have a problem. And the problem is that we have all suffered under bad leaders. And also we've all acted as bad leaders in the sphere of responsibilities in which God has placed us. I mean, who here has been perfectly selfless, caring, and gentle in all things? See any hands out there? Who here has never been selfish or passive or harsh? I have a long history of having a harsh edge to how I speak. When I took on my new leadership role as an, an area leader over Latin America, I asked the head of our mission organization if he had any concerns about me. And he said, sometimes you can feel intimidating to people. You can intimidate people. There's a kind of harshness, a kind of domineeringness to that. You see, it's easy to look down on bad leaders, right? It's easy to think about how others have failed you. Maybe your parents, or your husband, or your wife, or your pastor, or your boss, or your president. But I think what God really wants for us today is that we take a good long look at ourselves. Because what we really need is to not just be saved from the bad leaders or just to act like good leaders. What we really need is to fix our hope on the very best leader, on Jesus Christ himself. Let me read a few more passages in chapter 34. I can't read it all, but I think this is a good summary of what we'll find. First, we see in verses 10 through 12 that the very best leader is God himself, and God himself will rescue his sheep. That's what the very best leader is like. It says in verses 10 through 12, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against the shepherd, and I'll require my sheep at their hand, and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths. As both an encouragement and a warning, Ezekiel says that God himself will oppose the faithless shepherds and he will rescue the sheep from their hands. And then in verses 15 through 16, we see that God will care for the sheep himself. God himself will care for the sheep. He says in verses 15 and 16, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. It's the exact opposite of the first five verses of Ezekiel 34. He will do what the faithless shepherds fail to do. He himself will care for the sheep. He will feed them and bind up the brokenhearted and strengthen the weak, and he will seek the lost. And then we find this incredible surprise in verses 22 through 25, where it tells us that Jesus himself will be our shepherd. That Jesus will be our shepherd. It says in verse 22, I will rescue my flock, they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them, he shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I the Lord will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them, I am the Lord, I have spoken, I will make with them a covenant of peace. God makes an amazing promise here. He promises that he will ultimately shepherd his people through Jesus, who is the son of David, the promised Messiah, the good 
shepherd, the very best shepherd. This text likely has some very specific applications for the nation of Israel and their future restoration. But the New Testament also makes clear that this saving reality now extends in some way to us as God's people in Jesus. Israel's one shepherd will also be our one shepherd, Jesus. Listen to these words from the four Gospels. Matthew 9, 36 says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In John 10, 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then in John 10, 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. In Luke 19, 10, Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In Mark 10, 42 through 45, Jesus calls to his disciples and says, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. I am gentle and lowly in heart. Jesus is the good shepherd. He is the very best shepherd. The one who looks on his people with compassion. Who will sacrifice his own life for their salvation. Who intimately knows each and every one of them by name. Who leaves behind the 99 to seek the one lost sinner. Who is the greatest of all because he is the greatest servant of all. He who is willing to ransom himself for us as the satisfying payment for sin on the cross. This gentle and lowly one is the good shepherd. He is the very best leader who has broken the back of sin and death and been raised from the dead in glory. This Jesus now stands as both our Savior and our model, our Redeemer and our example if we will trust in him. As sinful men and women, myself included, we are more like the bad shepherds of Ezekiel 34 than we would like to admit. For that reason, may we turn to Jesus in faith to save us from ourselves and from our sin. And may we follow the example of of his leadership in every sphere of life. As parents over our children, as supervisors in our workplaces, as husbands and wives and teachers and soccer coaches and student leaders and nursery workers and pastors. May we too be gentle and lowly, compassionate in our care, selfless and kind and patient and just, willing to give over our very lives to seek and to save sinners, to feed the hungry, strengthen the weak, bind up the injured, bring back the strayed, and proclaim with boldness the good news of the gospel of peace. That's good leadership. That's the best kind of leadership. Let me pray. Thank you, Father, for your leadership, for the leadership of your Son, 
for seeking us when we were lost, for saving even bad shepherds. May we be more like you in every sphere of life so there might be flourishing in every sphere of life for your glory and the good of your creation and your people. In Jesus' name, amen.